I think I'll just take, uh, take the lead here. Uh, welcome to the Scaling Leadership and Organizing Campaigns Room. Um, so the purpose of this room is for us to talk about um, how to work with our constituencies. As we were talking about in the big room, um, we were saying about the challenges in terms of how to bring people in, how to keep them with us in the long term. So we're going to have Art uh, Reyes the uh, Third from We the People. Um, he's going to be talking about how his organization brings in different uh, constituencies that are different doing campaigns around the world and bringing them together around, uh, sorry, Michigan, um, and to work together. Um, then we're also going to hear from Kanoko uh, Kamata, who's the co-founder of um, Community Organizing Japan. And she's going to talk about a campaign they did about um, sexual assault in Japan and how now they're moving it into a new phase and so how they worked in this transition in terms of um, keeping or organizers as well as bringing in new blood into the campaign. And then we have Linda Hutchins Knowles. Um, she's from Mothers Out Front. She's the founder of the San Diego, right, um, group. And she's... San Jose, sorry, I, my bad. <laughs> um, and so she's going to be talking about how Mothers Out Front um, uh, will bring started and how they bring in organizers as well as how to keep them in their campaigns. So um, we will start with Art. <laughs> um, and uh, Art, you're going to have five minutes, please. Okay, unmuted. Can folks hear me? Yes. Yes? Yeah, all right, cool. All right, I will, I'm going to go through uh, some of this quickly, but excited to be back in conversation with you all. Again, my name is Art Reyes. I lead an organization called We the People. We really focus on building multiracial working class organizing infrastructure across the state of Michigan. I mentioned a little bit earlier, moderating the last session, uh, Flint is home for me. That's where I grew up. My family came there. Uh, at a time when Flint was very much this beacon of hope for working people. Uh, it was a place where there was a very important labor struggle, the Flint sit-down strike that happened that really opened up uh, opportunity for industrial unions uh, in the United States. It was a place where uh, factory workers, all of my family are all factory workers, had a shot to make uh, a decent union wage and be able to raise a family uh, with with stability. Um, as I was growing up, that was beginning to change pretty significantly. And in recent years, you know, we've made kind of global news around the Flint water crisis. So in a lot of ways, um, for, for me, it was the water crisis that really pulled me home in a very visceral way to come back home to launch We The People. Um, just briefly, uh, I was sitting uh, in my office. I was the national training director for uh, a national community organizing group called the Center for Popular Democracy. When my friend Wani, who I'd grown up with, called me, uh, she had just left the house of an undocumented immigrant family on the east side of the city of Flint. Um, and she called me and said they did not know about the water crisis until President Obama declared a state of emergency. This was in January of 2016. They tried to go get water from one of the official distribution centers the state had set up, uh, and they were turned away because they didn't have ID. Uh, and there had been rumors of an ICE raid uh, of, uh, kind of the government immigration services coming in uh, and detaining uh, immigrant families for deportation at the grocery store in their neighborhood, so they were afraid to buy water. Um, this was... Uh, they had an 11 month old baby. The mother had been drinking the water and breastfeeding. So their child was sick. It had a rash level its body and they didn't know what to do. Uh, this was the same neighborhood that my family had moved to uh, when Flint was a beacon of hope for working people. So I came home to work very intensely with residents, um, some family members, with organizers to really work to build organizing capacity to fight back on the water crisis, knowing that unless it was directly impacted people who were really leading this fight, it would be for nothing. Um, and I think for me, one of the big lessons coming out of that and coming back home to Michigan was it wasn't just Flint and it wasn't just water. And this wasn't a crisis of policy. It wasn't a natural disaster. Um, it was a crisis of power. Um, it was a crisis that communities like Flint uh, were not ones that, uh, that, that people in power cared enough about uh, to pay attention to. And so we had to do a significant amount of work to begin shifting that. So 
I decided to come home about 18 months ago uh, to launch We The People, uh, and I'm going to dive in quickly on what some of that work uh, looks like, and then I know we can have room for more conversation after we hear from others out front and from community organized in Japan. Um, so in a brief way, uh, some of our work was shaped uh, in, in, in this way. So we started with doing intensive community organizing workshops, holding listening sessions in a number of communities uh, across the state, uh, that for us led to building regional agendas through regional agenda committees, beginning to understand and analyze power in our state, beginning to build our shared analysis together on political education, leading to um, our first statewide convention uh, that I'll talk about here in a second, and the building of a people's agenda. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Michigan, Michigan is a state in the upper Midwest in the United States. Um, we are one of the most segregated places in the country. We have the single most segregated metropolitan area in the country in uh, Metro Detroit. Uh, and we are um, the state in the United States that has recovered the least uh, from the economic recession that we had. So we have a number of communities, both rural and urban, that have faced multi-generational economic devastation. For us, what we we're talking about in the last session with Marshall and Hari um, around, uh, around um, some of the, the, the challenges with fear, uh, Michigan in particular has been a place where there's been very heavy divide and conquer politics. So we've chosen to begin working across the state, working across a number of very diverse uh, constituencies. So we started with five intensive community organizing workshops uh, in places uh, across the state. Um, Rowan, and too, if you wouldn't mind just flagging me when I'm getting close to time, that would be helpful. So, you know, as we can see uh, here on this screen, this is, you know, we did trainings with a little over 150 leaders from across the state in some places like the Upper Peninsula, which is very rural, mostly white and Native American, uh, in the top left corner coming down to Detroit, which is largely people of color, uh, black, brown, immigrant, and Muslim communities. We did these intensive community organizing workshops using the pedagogy that we use within the Leading Change Network across the state because for us, uh, really beginning to dive in and build strong organizing capacity uh, where, where, where people are, are diving in and building uh, and, and building uh, strong campaigns and fighting within their own communities was really important. Um, okay, I'm seeing a thing on time and some questions and then that I'll get to later. The last couple of things that I'll just go through quickly. We did a series of listening sessions across a number of communities, black, brown, rural, white, uh, working class and poor folks launching uh, regional agenda committees across the state that uh, came together to build uh, a central committee that built a people, a proactive people's agenda that at our first statewide convention, uh, which we called the Idlewild convening, we had 120 key grassroots leaders from black, brown, white, indigenous, Muslim and immigrant communities coming together to begin building together and ratifying a proactive people's agenda that lays out what's a proactive vision of the state that we want to be fighting for. Some pictures uh, of that of that here, political education, some of those things, uh, doing some of our power mapping and analysis. We were visited by you know, some, some uh, folks that are supportive of us, like Jane Fonda, who came by to, to say hello. Uh, and uh, the work ahead as we're diving in, and then I'll, I'm, I'm going to be wrapping up, um, is about how are we how are we creating a moment where people across race, working class people, across a number of communities that have uh, faced pretty significant challenges are coming together, recognizing a linked fate and building proactive power to shape the future of our state. We're in the middle of a very intense battle around a thing called lame duck, uh, where many of our democratic institutions and roles are being attacked. And because of the work that we've done multiracially over the past 18 months, we are in the midst of responding to all of to all of that it's been a lot of national media around that we're anchoring this very big lame duck fight uh, that's that's happening right now and for us what's really important in this moment just the last thing that I'll that I'll that I'll say um, is this is this is a moment of mobilization that's happening uh, that because of the organizing work that we've been doing over the past 18 months we're well equipped to respond to it but very very importantly is we don't see this moment as the entirety of the fight. This is the first public battle in a much longer fight 
for working class people multiracially who are experiencing threat and attack at the same time for us to be able to use that moment uh, to, to build and reshape and reclaim power in our state for working class families uh, across race and across a number of geographic barriers as well. So uh, uh, I know that that's fast, uh, but, but that's some of the work and how it's, how it's shaping up. So I'm gonna kick it back over uh, to Rowan to, uh, to, to pass it to the, next, to the next speaker. Great, thanks. I'd actually like to quickly introduce Michael. He needed <laughs> uh, tech challenges. Michael, I'm gonna give you the floor, but um, just because of time, I think uh, the next two people can make sure you stop at five minutes a sharp so that we'll have around 10 to 15 minutes Q&A. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks, Art. Um, happy to be with you all. Sorry, I was slow getting here because of some tech issues. Um, but let's um, bump it right over to Kanoko, and um, I will just go into screen share in order to do that. Unless Kanoko, did you have your own slide? You you have your own slides that you're going yeah, to share, I have right? My own slide okay. you. So we'll ignore mine. <laughs> They're not important. <laughs> and um, take it away, and I'll start the timer now. Okay. And can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so let's start. Um, so hi, my name is Kanoko Kamata. Uh, I am from Japan, but currently living in Cambridge, Massachusetts and trying to shift my career as organizer to academia. So today I will talk about uh, how we have transitioned from one campaign to a new campaign and how do we retain people. And first of all, thank you, give, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my experience. So um, it, in 2016, we, in, we launched a campaign to change penal code on sexual violence. So it has not been updated for 110 years. And revision was planned for three years, but very slow and then still lots of loophole. Uh, so we wanted to speed up the process and address these loopholes. So we worked for nine months and then we could pass the reform. That's a really big deal. Uh, so also we could insert a new legal clause to review the revised law in three years, which is 2020. Um, this is a significant because we have opportunity to address loopholes like age of consent is still 13, definition of rape is still contains use of physical violence and threat. So in Japan, and also a social movement is more for older people in their 60s and 70s, um, but many young professionals and college students joined our campaign. So uh, when we started the campaign, uh, we started with four organizations, uh, Chabujo, Survivors Group on Sexual Crimes Law, Happy Tears, and Tomorrow Girls Troops. So um, as we do the campaign, especially Chabujo and Survivors Group has gained people. Uh, Chabujo recruited college students, survivors group re recruited survivors. Um, today, I will talk about survivors group, but I'm happy to talk about Chabujo and organizing college students too in the Q&A session. So survivors group was uh, not a formal organization. And, and then although it, sh it, sh it started a few years back, um, but it's still an informal organization. So towards the end of the campaign, Jun Yamamoto, the picture in the center, uh, leader of the survivors group, realized that power of advocacy by many people and decided to launch the organization for advocacy by survivors to continue the effort. So um, I joined her, initi her initiative as a founding board member. So that nonprofit organization, uh, Spring, was the name of the organization, uh, launched in, on July 7th in 2017. And this is a picture of the kickoff event. So this is our campaign timeline. The goal is to that the government make decision to reform the penal code further by 2020. So from 2017 to 2018, we realized that party hearings, justice committee hearings that we demanded. Uh, in 2019, we will expand our activities all over Japan to pressure politicians locally. Uh, politicians highly value our strategic bipartisan advocacy. And we also mobilize many younger people when we have events in the Congress that give pressure to politicians. So uh, these are the slides, uh, 
the current members. So we have several teams like lobbying team, event team, and an empowerment team, PR team. So uh, I have to hide the member's name because uh, they want to hide their identity as a survivors. So uh, new members start from team members occasionally um, or occasional volunteers. Then they started from simple tasks and we eventually make them to lead one of the teams. So we have 24 core members and currently and 70 supporters and seven people came from previous campaign 2017. Um, so in 2019, we aim to expand our activities locally. So North Hokkaido and Tohoku, uh, South Kyushu and Shikoku and West. So I want to summarize that what worked in increase retain people. So we have a clear goal to realize a further penal code reform like age of consent is still 13, narrow definition rape. That's we have a clear goal to change. And the big factor is that we have a success case we realized that 2017 reform by people's power. So leadership committed to nurture next leadership and expanding nationwide. So many members joined because of the previous success. So since previous campaign, we emphasize a share stories. It is painful to share survivor story, but also useful empowering survivors and building empathy. Um, survivors are, Okay. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you, but we're at five minutes. So if you can just wrap up in the next. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. And um, yeah, actually this last slide. <laughs> okay. And then, um, uh, so challenges, uh, we, we have to overcome the stigma. So usually the uh, sexual violence that associated with a shameful and dark. So we always try to be the light and fun accessible through the tactics and retaining survivors is also challenging. Uh, because sharing stories can trigger PTSD and uh, other pains. So we have a counseling sessions by professional counselors, and we also have events uh, for, to empower members. And building trust and relationship among members is also uh, challenging, so we're now expanding our one-on-one -on -one effort uh, to all among members. And also, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to create safe space to raise concern. So we've kind of improved meeting facilitation skill, um, then try to elicit the opinions from members as much as possible. And um, that's it from now me. Thank you. Thank you, Kanoko. Um, so let's go right away over to Linda Hutchins Knowles. Um, Linda, take the screen. Hear me okay? Yes. And can you see my screen? Yes, right now. Yeah, okay, it just became full screen. Okay, awesome. Thanks. I'm giving myself a, a time check halfway through. Okay. Perfect. So I'm excited to be on the call today and to share with you about our local team of mothers in San Jose, California, focusing on how we recruited, engaged, and retained. Ask a question from earlier about how do people engage. Um, I'll talk about that, what we did. First of all, about our organization. We're a group of mothers that are mobilizing for a livable climate for all children. This is a picture of us at the big Rise for Climate March in San Francisco. And March, I mean in September. Um, we were founded about six years ago and Marshall Gantz and Hari Ha and Joy Cushman mentored us, so we really follow this organizing model. We're now in eight active states in the United States and expanding into new ones that have thousand active supporters and many people giving many hours each week. Um, the way I got involved um, is I saw a chart about climate change that scared the bejeebies out of me <laughs> that really made me realize we need to act now. We can't wait for our kids to grow up, that parents need to get engaged and who, but parents would care the most about a safe future for their kids. And I met um, a woman named Stacy who had the same concern and together we became good friends and started a local team of mothers up front in San Jose. This is our growth over time. Um, actually this growth happened before the big jump here, but we weren't part of Nation Builder then. But anyway, I'm gonna talk about right here how we grew about 900 people in our movement over like five or six months and how we sustain that growth to where we are today in California. So I'm gonna go quickly through this. We are just organizing mothers. Our campaign was to get the city council in San Jose and the mayor to adopt community choice energy. This is a way for a city to run its own utility to source cleaner energy. And our plan was to show, to get them to do it, to show how many constituents wanted it, making it untenable to oppose passionate mothers and youth. Sorry, sometimes that cursor goes away, okay. So our first challenge we faced was how do we recruit some very busy moms um, to be active on climate change? Here in the Silicon Valley, people's lives are really busy, but what we did was we did one-on-ones with our good friends that we knew cared about the environment but weren't taking action, 
and we did house parties that we talked about this with people, made it really fun and social. We also did movie screenings, and that was a really successful tactic, because after seeing a scary movie on climate change, people were really primed to take action, and they were excited to hear what they could do about it. And we, of course, talked to mothers' groups and students' um, schools. We did marches and rallies and tabling. Halfway, wow, okay. Um, and you guys probably all know this, we used a next step form to kind of match people up with what their interests were and what they could do to get involved. So the next chat tactic or challenge we had after having a base of people was how do we engage these people in meaningful activities to advance our campaign? Most of them were first time activists. So we did team meetings every three weeks with food to keep people engaged and excited. And we did trainings um, and organizing practices. We helped them write letters to the editor. We got three published in our local newspaper, the Mercury News. We did meetings with the council members. And most importantly, public narratives by the moms and kids. This is what actually moved the city council the most. You can see Amanda here. She's a nurse talking about the health impacts of climate change. And here is Ariana, who was only 11 at the time. And she said to them, you can see the mayor smiling at this, but like, you've been studying community choice energy for six years since I was five years old. When are you finally going to act? And we had a big impactful campaign by collecting signatures on Mother's Day postcards, emphasizing that we didn't want flowers or chocolate. We wanted a little climate for our kids. And we delivered 300 of them in person together to City Hall the week before the vote. Each individual council member got their own pack of postcards from their own constituents delivered by moms and kids. So this made a big splash. The mayor tweeted us about us. Um, we got the Amplified our message on Facebook and Twitter. And so we had moms engaged in all of these different activities. And what was the result? All 10 council members and the mayor voted unanimously for Community Choice Energy. It was a really big victory and we were recognized, we were one of the, only a few groups working, one of many groups working on it, but we were recognized for really building the political will there at the end. We kind of came into the campaign and got it over the finish line. Okay, um, I think I only have like a minute and a half left. So quickly, our third challenge, how could we engage people, keep them engaged after this big win? And it was summertime starting, which in the United States is a hard time for moms because their kids are out of school. But we did a celebration with our allies, with our team, with cake, that was important. Um, we recognized their contributions with students of appreciation and speeches about what they each contributed. And we did a really fun, quick follow-up action, delivering cupcakes for Father's Day and thanking the council members. We created a really great video. There's a link to that here and at the end. Um, and we gathered to debrief the campaign and research the next campaign. At that meeting, we integrated some new leaders and we revised our snowflake roles because really Stacy and I had taken on a lot of the work. We wanted to share it out better. So we had two people in each of our key roles on our snowflake so they could really share the responsibilities. And we stayed engaged. We had, we had a big threat to our big victory and we got, uh, did an email and uh, calling campaign. We kept meeting even in the summer and we did a community service project, which was really exciting. And we did a training. There's uh, Jake who's on the call today and Anna here <laughs> leading Ash. We were so lucky that came to our neighborhood and we got to take it. We had six leaders take the training. And we took it to scale in other towns. Um, and then we started a new campaign, which was actually uh, focusing on a state issue, not a local issue. So that's the summary of the tactics we used and the four key learnings. We built the team through one on ones, gathered more people moved them up, you guys know all this, um, kept them engaged. So thank you for listening. I hope I got it done in time. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I'll, we will be back in the main room in just a few minutes here, I think in just about four minutes. So I think we maybe have time for one or two questions. Um, I'm wondering if someone can just either raise a hand or even jump in um, so that there's no um, I'll, I'll ask a first question, and then if you have a follow-up, um, raise your... Okay, I see a hand there. So, Celine, um, can you unmute yourself or... Yeah, because I can't unmute you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, actually, uh, skilling is one of the main issues I've been facing as an organizer with my... Uh, with my movement, uh, I mean, after the core team, how do you scale up? And this is very, you know, very challenging. And especially how also do you manage to have several team working together while keeping a sense of unity? Uh, this is also a problem we've been facing that, for example, we have our media team and we have like one of our, you know, our campaign team. And you know, most of the time what happened is like, each teams are working separately, having their own meetings and so on. And so how do you keep um, 
yani the, as a, a one movement but so we actually managed to changed a bit that uh, with technology so that's why i became very interested yani, with technology and how it can help uh, but i would be interested to hear about other experience Does someone want to jump in on that? One of you expand on it on the on the use of technology or Sure, I'm I'm happy to dive in. I I super appreciate the question Celine because I think that is a very real one particularly for folks that are using this particular model. It's very easy to what we call develop strong leadership islands, right? Where you have a really good core team of people that really functions well together, but really struggles to build a base kind of further outside of that. For 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 us at least, like it is like how we're finding some of the the immediate peaks so that way there's always constantly something to do and structuring the work. I mean Hari says this a lot, which I really appreciate, but how do you structure the work in a way that it it the work suffers if everyone isn't uh, isn't actually engaging more people and pulling it in and, and pulling more folks into the into the space. I think for us, it's been focused on doing things. So we end up doing a lot of things like having potlucks and strategy meetings where folks are coming together and everyone is required to then bring more people in and then build their own teams and doing a lot of things like cross coaching across teams, which I find to be really helpful. So that way teams aren't diverging because it's really easy as well, right? To build a bunch of really strong teams then form their own identity and then begin to diverge and making sure that there's consistent relationships across those we found to be really important. So I really appreciate the question. Uh, I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll stop there and see if other folks have things to chime in on. Michael, you're muted. Yes, okay. yes, thanks. I just saw that. I was looking for other hands that have popped up. Ruan, are we being pulled back now at 350? Yeah. Yeah. We 60 seconds. So if you could just press um, leave breakout rooms, but thank you everyone. Thanks Art, um, <clears throat> Kanoko, and Linda. And I'm sorry we ran out of time uh, for Q&A, but hopefully we'll bring you again for more time and more deeper discussions. Right on. Thank you so much all. Great stuff. All right. See you back in the main room, everybody. <laughs>